2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. Good afternoon, everybody. This is your DFS Army Bold Calls podcast for NBA on Wednesday, December 19th, 2018. I am your host today, Boomer's Daddy, joining you from the uh, cold and rainy and ugly, well, it's not really cold. It's about 55, 60 degrees, but it's wet and rainy, Oklahoma. And out there in sunny Southern California, Mr. Bear. What's up? Hey, hey, how's it going? Uh, well, <laughs> for me, it's uh, it's about normal. For you, though, on the other hand, I want to be the first to congratulate you publicly out in the open off of Twitter. Um, I've already done it privately a numerous amount of times. Mm -hmm. But uh, congratulations last night on nailing your seat to the FanDuel World Fantasy Basketball Championship. Thank you. That makes both you and our other NBA guru, Luce Meister, uh, live finalist. Uh, two down, one to go. Yeah, I mean, two down. Hopefully, more than one. You're definitely one of them, and we. I want to. I want to get some of our members in there, and I want to get some of our other coaches in there. But uh, thank you for the congrats, and thank you to everybody last night uh, in our you know chat forums for the for the congrats. And I got a phone call from. The owner of our company for the congrats, and I got a call from you, and I got a call from Luz, and uh, like I said, all the messages and all, all the Twitter love. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm super excited. I, I spent, you know, the latter part of about two and a half, three weeks, um, you know, not as active uh, in our coaching because I wanted to get this, and I got it, and I'm very happy, and I, I can't wait to represent us out there. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um... Heather asked me last night, she's like, so does this mean you're, you, you're going out there no matter what? I was like, well, that's already predetermined. You know, I go out there every year. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the goal is, is obviously for us to be out there together. And she knows that that only happens when I qualify. So she's like, well, why didn't you play in it last night? I was like, I tried to take yesterday off and play light because it was a four game slate and uh, we've got a huge weekend coming up and you're, you're going, well, why didn't I play? But no, she was, she was extremely happy for you. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun when we take over South or uh, Southern California. So for sure. Hey, wait, it's in Southern California, right? Yes. Okay. I, I always get mixed up where Southern and Northern and what's SoCal and what's NoCal and all that good stuff. So, um, anyways, <laughs> we got a huge 12 game slate today. Uh, a lot to unpack here. We're not going to hit on all of our favorite plays like we normally do. We've kind of, uh, break, broke it down a little bit. So we're just going to hit on, uh, some of our favorite guys our most favorite guys, um, so we're going to start it off at the point guard position as always on a huge game or a huge slate. Uh, seems like the top play on the board is my buddy, my brother from another mother, Russell Westbrook. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this, uh, this game in general is one that you and I are both very fond of, um, very high on. So yeah, I'm right there with you. And, and I think we're on it for a couple of reasons. Um, and let's see what the Vegas line here has it at, at a five and a half spread for the Thunder. Um, the total is the largest on the board at 235. Okay. Um, now, one of the big things I want to say about this is as a Thunder fan and um, knowing basketball the way that I do, uh, usually what you think is going to happen, usually <laughs> more times than not, does not happen. 
And what I say by that is this, is when we went to, or when Sacramento came to us on October 21st, the final score was 131 to 120. Now that game was without Russell Westbrook uh, and Sacramento beat us. Okay. So we turned around uh, in the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving, we go to Sacramento. That game was 117 to 113. Again, Sacramento beat us. Yeah. We have not beat the Kings this year. Okay. And typically, even when Boogie was there and no matter what, we typically have a hard time with the Kings. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it is, but they play us and they have for the last couple years very, very, very well. Um, and that has not changed with the new personnel. Now, I think part of it is, is the fact that Dave Yeager spent a lot of time with Memphis and he had success against the Thunder when he was with Memphis as well. Um, I also think part of it is, is the Thunder's defense, as most NBA teams, is not typically as good on the road. And we have breaking news. The Raiders just signed Colin Kaepernick. What? No, they didn't. They signed Nathan Peterman. Oh, it said, oh, sorry. It said the Raiders, Klein Schmidt, you, you got me this time. They said the Raiders just signed not Colin Kaepernick. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Jesse, she got me that time. So, um, anyways, it's it's one of those things like, for whatever reason, like I said, the, the Kings do play us very, very well. Yeah. Right? Um, the, the difference between... Um, our defense at home at the peak and our defense on the road is, I don't want to say significant, but it, there's a definite drop off uh, as most teams in the NBA are typically better at home than they are on the road for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. But the one thing that is very glaring is the three point percentage from road to home. And if you want to go ahead and talk, I will pull up those numbers here real quick. Yeah, so just a little bit about what you were saying uh, re regarding, uh, you know, the uh, Kings and, and Thunder. So I just want everybody to, to, to know, you probably already know, but for those of you who might not know, who don't maybe watch or don't maybe follow the games as much as, as, as we do, the Kings are, this is, these are not your Kings of the last three, four, five seasons. This is a very, very good Sacramento Kings ball club. They have young talent. They have veteran presence. They have uh, kind of like right in between both of those guys that have been in the league for four or five years who are coming into their own. They play solid defense. Um, they, they have a tremendous pace. They're a really, really solid team. The Thunder are, are, are just as, if not more solid of a team. They don't have as many young guys as the Kings do, which is going to be their advantage later into the playoffs, uh, you know, and in terms of, of getting through the playoffs. But this is going to be a very, 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 very close game. There's, I don't have any doubt about that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if we lose again. I wouldn't either, particularly in Sacramento. And here's something to add to that. Bogdanovich has, he missed shoot around. He's been questionable. He's been sick he's not all there i just see now that schumpert plans on playing to me that shows me they're probably bracing themselves to not have bogdanovich which yep. is a really big loss for them because the kid is just a ball player yeah so we'll talk a little bit about who we like and i mean i didn't have bogdanovich on my radar anyways uh because i didn't think he would play when i saw him pop up as questionable uh he kind of didn't look right last game. He did not. Um, and you and I saw it, and I'm like, uh oh. I mean, uh, nobody did. The, the whole team didn't look right, but besides Buddy Hield. Um, and even then, when it got completely out of hand, there was no point in playing Buddy Hield. He could have been off to a huge night, but uh, or it could have ended up rather with a huge night. But um, so so you want you want to talk about? Well, first of all, tell us tell us what you found. 
Okay, so this year overall, this is home and, ro- home and away. Uh, this is opponent three-point shooting percentage for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, it's 33.1%, which is top five in the NBA for the whole year. Now, here's where the discrepancy comes into lie. At home, it's 32.1 with a 34% on the road, okay? Now, that's still really, really good. But over the last three, it's 39.5%, which, if I'm not mistaken, that is sixth worst in the NBA over the last three games. Hmm. So... I don't know. I I would have to go back and look and see exactly what happened because I'm not 1000% sure, but I know that, um, who was it? Who was it? Uh, Gallinari put a big dent into that. Of course, the Nuggets game put a big dent into that. The Pelicans game put a big dent into that. And, you know, well, that's not, that's four games ago, but you know, the Bulls, they, they, for whatever reason, like, we just haven't been able to guard the three-point line as well over the last week or so. And I don't know what it is, but it, it's a little concerning, especially when you've got guys like Buddy Heald, uh, Nemanja Belizia, who we'll talk about both of them later, De'Aaron Fox. Um, Amon Shumpert's going to come in. He's going to play if Bogdanovich is out, probably, what do you say, 28 to 30 minutes or so. But he's been known to get hot from beyond the arc. Um, so, But these guys, they they shoot the three, and they shoot it in transition, and they shoot it a lot. So the, the thing that I'm worried about is, you know, because Oklahoma City is not a good three-point shooting team. Right. We get out in transition from our defensive stops, which is how, you know, Russ runs, you know, but that's why I like Paul George so much. And we'll talk about him is because he is our best three point shooter. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the insight on, you know, exactly how I feel about this, obviously. And if you, if you just look at Russ and his last, uh, three seasons against the Kings. Okay. Um, now with being in the same division, we play them a lot. So we've got a nice little nine game sample size. Cause he missed the first game earlier this season, mm-hmm. but he hasn't hit low or below, um, 49 DK points and below 43 and a half Fandle points in the last three seasons with the highest 69. I think Russ might be a little bit low owned because of a situation we'll talk about, um, you know, a little bit later, but I think he's going to be lower owned. I'm not talking like single digit, like lower single digits, like three, four percent, but I think maybe like ten to twelve. Yeah, maybe Probably. not because of the total. It, no, it's... look, here, here's why it will be, uh, in my opinion, because you've got you've got Anthony Davis, yeah, you've got James Harden, you've got you know, Drew Holiday, you've got Joel Embiid, I mean, you've got... And the perception of Russ becoming a quote-unquote true point guard and distributing more and not having to do as much might hurt his ownership, too. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next guy here, Kyrie Irving. Tell us why you like him. Well, I mean, Kyrie, it's, it's the matchup. I mean, it's versus Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix is... You know, they're, they're always giving up the most points and, and to, to players. Guys seems to have, seem to have career nights against them. More importantly, um, more importantly, there's a scenario where I actually think this game is going to be close. I think the Suns <laughs> are playing a little bit better now. Um, uh, like a lot better. They've won three in a row. Like we talked about, yeah, like we talked about the last uh, pod that you and I did a couple of days ago. It's amazing what happens when you get your best player back, right? And so he's back and he's fully into the swing of it. We'll talk about him here in the shooting guards. But um, if I can get a close, well, forget close. If I can get four quarters of Kyrie Irving in a close game versus a 
Phoenix Suns team that can't defend the guards, then that's exactly who I want. And that's what I think is going to happen. You're going to have probably a combination of Booker and Melton on him, mostly Melton, um, on him. Um, and that's something that I would like to take advantage of. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, Kyrie's shown that he, um, it, it's funny because I listen to a lot of NBA, um, radio on Sirius XM and what ends up happening is they'll talk about a bunch of these guys, um, and a bunch of scenarios and stuff like that where, uh, and a hot topic has been how Boston is, has kind of gelled and finally has some team definition with some of the moves that they've made with the starting lineup. And one of those is inserting Marcus Smart into the starting lineup. And the other one is inser- is moving uh, Gordon Hayward to the bench. And the reason why this is so like dynamic and, and really, really uh, important is because of the fact that now you don't have Kyrie, Baines, or sorry, not Baines, Horford, um, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and Gordon Hayward. Now, that's a star-studded starting five. Don't get me wrong. Right. But there's only one ball. So if you take that depth or that that star-studded starting five, like we talked about earlier in the season, and you shuffle it up and move some a couple of these guys to the bench, of course, it doesn't hurt that Horford's out right now, but you move a couple of these guys to the bench and you can stagger them, back and forth now all of a sudden Kyrie is the alpha on the first unit and then Gordon Hayward can be the alpha on the second unit you can add in Terry Rozier then Marcus Smart brings in that defensive grit Jason or Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are both very very good defenders in their young careers so far but with that said it's one of those things like Marcus Smart is one of the best perimeter defenders in the NBA mm-hmm. and it, it's so funny because we talk a lot about BVP throughout the baseball season but Marcus Smart's bugaboo is a guy that we're going to talk about here shortly but I love the ping pong with these guys and now that Kyrie is that alpha dog and it's defined on that first unit he's been balling man like, we were on him at 12% the other night, and the only thing that prevented him from hitting 55-60 was the fact that that game got so out of hand so quick that he yeah. didn't need to do it. Right. Right. So, um, all right, we talked a little bit about that uh, Oklahoma City game. Why don't you talk about the other point guard in that game that you like? Because we're yeah. on the same page with everything so far. I mean, Darren Fox, uh, so... Uh... You know, here's what I'm hoping, and I'm not so sure that it'll hold any weight, but I'm hoping that after that last game of a dud on a back-to-back that he, you know, put up like two points and didn't play much, he put like six minutes yeah. or whatever it was, that people are like, no, screw him. But this is this is where I want Fox in this matchup at home, coming off of that disappointing game, uh, getting back on track in, in the fast-paced environment. Um, you know, this is the type of game where I could see Fox put up like 12, 13 assists you know, 25 points. I mean, that's kind of what I'm envisioning. Um, it's really all about the pace. It's about playing at home. It's about coming off of a disappointment game uh, that I love about Fox so much. And also, um, you know, I think if they're going to be down Bogdanovic, then he'll need to score, pick up the scoring even more, uh, along with his backcourt mate and Buddy Heald. So um, those are all the things that have me pointing to De'Aaron Fox as one of my top plays. Yep, I completely agree with you on this as well. Um, you know, he uh, he played 42 minutes against the Thunder um, back in October. Uh, put up 43.8 um, fan, or Fanduel points. You've got um, a guy that is, like we said, he's coming into his own. Um, you know, he's he's shown to have success in this matchup. Uh, now he did only put up 25 in Oklahoma city, but I mean, that's a tough place to play. Uh, and, and that game was, that game was just weird all around. I think he got in a foul trouble too that game. Uh, no, he had three. So, um, it's just one of those things like, you know, the guy, we were all over the guy the other night. Um, he 
obviously completely put up a dud. Six minutes, 0 for 4 from the field. Um, <laughs> he had one offensive rebound and one turnover. Didn't play. He played the first six minutes of the game and did not come back on the court since. Yep, absolutely. He did not. So, he did not. I mean, of and, course he's going to dud. He can't. You can't put up numbers from the bench. So. I, I I hate the I hate the 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 plus minus stat. Like I, I, I think it's the worst stat that people can go to for basketball yeah. because a guy can stand in the corner and be a plus 31 yeah, and a guy can stand in, it can never be an on ball defender or be involved in part of the play at all and be a minus 31. Like, sure. I think it's a horrible, horrible stat, but in that I, I've never seen this number be so drastic in this short amount of time, his plus minus against Minnesota was a minus 27 in six minutes. It was unbelievable. Yeah, and I think if you probably look a little bit deeper, the, the, the entire starting unit was the same. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, was, all it was just downright horrible. So um, it, it was – that's when you just throw up your hands. You're like, oh, well. You yeah. Know, you made the right play. It just – you know, it had nothing to do with the back end of a back-to-back. It had nothing to do with the travel. It had nothing to do with anything like that, except they're a young team. They came out flat, and Dave Yeager sent a message. Yeah. And I think, I, I honestly think that message was received. Oh, At yeah. At least that's what I'm kind of hoping, anyways. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, yeah, it's got to be. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the starters did not see the game. They did not see the court after the first six minutes of the game. That's about as direct a message as you can get. So if they didn't get that, then they, they need to get their eyes or ears or minds checked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, Derek Rose. Um, obviously, this one's going to be quick. Jeff Teague's out. Uh, this is going to be a nice little matchup tonight. We've mm-hmm. got uh, the uh, you know, Reggie Jackson and that backcourt's really not that great. Um, I honestly don't think that he sees um, – Stanley Johnson or Luke Kennard, um, because I don't think that they're going to want to leave Wiggins out there kind of by himself. Um, it's just, you know, Wiggins and Rocco are kind of going to kind of draw those bigger body defenders. And I think that this is a fantastic, fantastic um, Derek Rose, Carl Anthony Towns type of correlation pair up game. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got those two paired already in some early builds, so I'm right there with you on that. And then, I mean, he's he's still priced very reasonably for a guy who's going to play, you know, well over 30 minutes um, in a game that is projected to be in their favor by five and a half points, mm-hmm. which meaning you know he's going to have to be involved. He's going to have to facilitate the entire offense for them. Um, you know, and it's one of those games too where, um, I, I really like, I like the pace. I like the pace that the, uh, the Wolves play at. Um, you know, I like the, the lack of defense from Detroit, um, pretty much all season, particularly at the guard spot. And, and Rose is a guy who attacks. So, uh, this year, right? I mean, he's, he's, He's healthy, man. He's he- he's healthy. He's or as healthy as I've seen him since his heyday, if you will. Um, he, he's getting to the basket and he's doing things that that we saw him do in his rookie year. I mean, not as explosive because I don't think I've ever seen anyone as explosive as a rookie Derrick Rose, and that's saying a lot. We've had some really explosive players in this league, man. Um, but but so he's not quite to that level. But I mean, he's he's right back. So uh, I. I think you're going to see a lot of ownership around Rose for the reasons that we just stated. So in your cash builds, you kind of just play him and move on. Um, I still think he's tournament worthy. I still think he has the upside in tournaments, uh, given his minutes, given Teague is out, given the, the opposition. Um, so yeah, I think you and I agree. Rose is pretty much about as solid as it gets. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I think he's a, uh, he's not, I don't think he's going to hit the core part today. He could, he very well could. He's right there on the fringe for me right now, um, and mainly because I'm. It, it's a little bit different with my build, but he's in a very, very high amount of my lineups right now, um, and uh, it's just kind of you know plug it in and let's go. 
So he he could end up being core by the end of the day. He's uh, very very close right now. Um, okay, we uh, there's not a lot of value at the point guard position today. Uh, most yeah. of our value is coming from other spots, which is fine. Right. Uh, but you have an interesting play down here at the bottom uh, that I want you to sell me on, uh, DJ Augustine. Yeah. So the Magic are without Nikola Vucevic. And you're thinking, what does the center have to do with the point guard? Well, Vucevic is pretty much 1A, 1B uh, in terms of offensive threats. And the Magic have a, have several with, with Gordon and Vucevic and Fournier and Terrence Ross. And, I mean, they have others, right? But um, Vucevic is pretty much at the top of that list. And so now you've got more shots to go around. Um, I, you know, DJ Augustine's going to play, in my opinion, a minimum of 30 minutes. Um, San Antonio is on the road. And if you look at the way these guys play defense on the road versus at home, um, you want to play them when they're on, the, against them when they're on the, uh, they're on the road. I mean, it's just something, it's just something I've been doing all season. Uh, they've improved a little bit, but they're still bad. I mean, you can improve and still suck, right? On defense. Mm -hmm. Um, you can suck and then not suck as much, but you still suck. So, um, so for me, I, you know, I really, I like to attack that backcourt. Um, and then, like I said, he's got another, uh, a bump there without Vucevic there. So someone's got to pick that up. I think a lot of people will go run to Aaron Gordon, which I, I believe was on your list, uh, which we'll talk about. We might, we, we might disagree on that one. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but for, for me, it's, it's two guys that I'm looking at. You know, actually, it's three guys, uh, but I'll only play two out of the three in one single lineup. Uh, that I like, and Augustine is one of those guys. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I have to disagree with you. I'm not, I'm not stepping in. I'm not smelling what you're stepping in on this one. Okay. Um, I, I can kind of see your point. I just, I, uh, if I'm gonna pay down at point guard today, I feel like I need to. Uh, there's another guy that I like that's down here, which, uh, you know, we're only supposed to cover a few on this, on this pod. So there are other lower guys that I like. I just think he has the most upside out of these guys. Uh, I guess I could see that. I, I think I might lean more towards like a Ryan Archidiacono. Or that was my, that was my other one. That was my okay. other one was, was, was our Archie the ice cream cone. Archer the ice cream cone. That was so, that was my other one. That was that's kind of where I think I would probably probably lead. I think now what is he on DK here? Um, come on, come on, come on, hurry up! So DJ Augustine. Okay, so on DK I don't mind it at all. Like for me, I think this would be a DK only type of play because he's 4k on dk he's 4800 on FanDuel, and guys like uh archie diacono d'anthony mountain terry Rozier, tony parker even uh trey burke these guys tyus jones tj mcconnell these guys are all cheaper um and i feel like are are better kind of they're they're not in that mid middle type of like I, I don't want a 4800 drop score is what i'm saying of course not you know and i i it, i'm finding it very very hard to skip out on all of these guys that i love at the top end sure. especially with all the value at other spots yeah so. and, and i and i agree and i think if you're looking for so if you if you want to get yourself two studs uh and you don't want to play a minimum price point guard and you're punting somewhere else as a drop score on FanDuel. You, you need to have somebody in the four or five K range that can put up a 30, 35. Right. And that's where I'm looking at DJ. I'm not looking at him as a top point guard by any stretch. Okay. Right. I'm just looking at it like, you know, I mean, we didn't even talk about another sneaky guy that I like in Ricky Rubio for tournaments. I mean, there's a lot of plays here you can look at that I'm interested in. I mean, you got yeah. Tim Frazier uh, who, who, I mean, there's a lot of options, <clears throat> excuse me, but out of that, like, under a 5K range for me, it's Augustine or Ice Cream Cone. Those are the two that I'm looking at. There you go. Uh, all right, let's move on to shooting guard here. Uh, we kind of nailed James Harden the other night, man. 
uh, Monday night, 5% owned, drops, what, 48 points, takes a, you know, travels all the way to Australia before he shoots the ball. Um, I mean, he, he was, he, he could do no wrong. Uh, and he was 5%. And I want to see. So go ahead and talk to me about James Harden while I look up this stat real quick. Yeah. So the first thing you have to know is he's playing the Washington Wizards. I mean, that's really all I should need to say. Secondly, um, the, the rocket. So he's in an absolute groove. I mean, I, he's, he's at MVP form. I, I, the way he's playing right now, yes, there are other fantastic players in this league, but the way it's right now, seedings aside, because they'll, they'll climb up, climb up the rankings here pretty soon, uh, in, in terms of, uh, positioning and seeding, but, uh, he's the MVP and he's putting up numbers that, I mean, he put up like a 70 fantasy the other night. I mean, the, the, he's just nonstop and he gets the Wizards who played last night. Um, and then on top of that, the, the Rockets are perfectly content now, which they weren't doing early in the year. And I think that's why they were losing their games. Uh, that and a couple of some other reasons, but they're perfectly happy with giving Harden the ball versus it being him and Chris Paul back and forth and saying, just go do what you do. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's working and he's getting to the line an insane amount of times. And frankly, a lot of people don't like it, and they're whining and bitching and complaining about it. But you know what? Harden's getting fouled. Harden is getting fouled. Some of them look like a bunch of crap because he just does it so many times. Well, that's that because I think... you could call a foul on every play. <laughs> I, I, you're right. I get what you're saying. I, know I just he's... think it happens. He does it so much that the average eye looks at the play and is like, "There's no way an NBA defender." Is he fall gets so for dramatic. So is right. I think is what it is. It, right. He's so dramatic. Okay, so uh, the other night that we call or we were talking about this, and I'll put <laughs> I'll put these stats again in my notes for James Harden because he is my top player of the day uh, yeah. for the position. Um, I said something like I could see him getting to the line another uh, fifteen to seventeen times um, because we looked at the refs and we looked at all that stuff. Uh, he got to the line sixteen times. Hit 15. So we nailed that one right on the head. He was uh, um, <laughs> he was 5% owned, guys, and he put up 71. So don't look for him to be 5% owned again. But I don't think that, you know, with the other situations, you know, I don't think that uh, he's going to be um, highly owned at all. In fact, there's a lot of my tournament teams that I'm making tonight that are starting with the Russ Harden combo. So, yeah, I don't hate it. Uh, all right, let's talk about Drew Holiday because uh, there's a lot of situations that we've got going on in this game. Uh, Anthony Davis is probably going to be the first place that everybody runs to in this game because Julius Randle and Nikola Mirotic are out. Uh, let's uh, let's break down the starting lineup here for these guys. You're going to have Tim Frazier at the one, Drew Holiday at the two, mm-hmm. um, each one more three, Solomon Hill is going to start for Julius Randle at the four, and then it's going to be Anthony Davis at the five. Um, now the biggest thing about this is, is that Anthony Davis's usage rate just goes skyrocketed through the roof. We know that Drew Holiday comes out right below it. Um, and there's a guy that I'll talk about, uh, here, um, you know, in in just a second that we could talk about too, but Drew Holiday, man, his price keeps going down. And his production has not really fallen off that much. Um, I I don't know how he is not one of your top plays of the position at the night, or at the pos- bleh, bleh, bleh. I don't know how he's not one of your top plays at the position based on the situation tonight. There I go. I spit it out. There you go. <laughs> so. Um, it's one of those things like we know he's going to play the minutes. He can play on the ball and off the ball. Yeah. He can, it, he's going to score you 20 point plus points. If he can just get some ancillary pieces, um, about say six and five, and then add in a couple steals, which he does, you know, almost on a nightly basis, he's got his steal totals are three, two, three, and three, the last four games. And then he had a zero and then, oh yeah, he had back to back games where he had four and four. Okay, yeah. so it, he 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 contributes in all aspects of the the game, and they're going to need him and 
Anthony Davis for this game to stay close. Right. For them to score because right. the Pelicans do not know how to slow it down consistently right. over the full course of the game in order to make sure that they aren't going to have to score. So. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't disagree with any of it, of course. Um, I just... Here's the thing. I think between AD and Drew, given... Excuse me, given Randall and to throw out, I just think you're going to see, like, super, super high ownership percentages. Now, we're talking about cash games. That's a different situation. Play these guys, move on. But in tournaments, I don't know that I want to go there. Um, I mean, Drew Holiday... Like, are you going to play Drew over Booker? Um, in FanDuel tournament, I, I mean, uh, in FanDuel tournaments, probably not. Right. But I will on DraftKings because yeah, because he's a hundred dollars cheaper. Sure. You know. Sure. But maybe then even you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, maybe I need to pay up that $100 to, you know, get to Booker because he'll be lower owned. Be- That's what I'm getting at. You know? That's exactly what I'm getting at. And Booker, we'll talk about him next, right? But yeah. Uh, but as far as Drew goes, if, I mean, I can certainly see um, the both of them going off, but it's almost like, it's going to be mostly Anthony Davis and, and some other pieces. Um, uh, I like Drew the most when Drew is the point guard. And now that they've got Frazier there, um, and I forgot the other gentleman's name, uh, they have there, those two guys are running the point guard. Frank and, Jackson, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly who it is. Uh, He's he becomes more of the shooting guard, which he's a good she's a good shooting guard, but I like the upside when he's the point guard. I I would agree, um, but him playing off the ball a little bit more allows him to be more active defensively. It does. It so does. I think it kind of cancels each other out, but the upside's not quite as high. So right, right. Um, maybe it's a cash game move more than a tournament play. That's what I'm um, unless you know something happens just because of the ownership and the upside isn't quite there. Uh, all right, let's talk about Devin Booker. Uh, we, in, in case you're living under a rock, you should know that Devin Booker likes to play the Boston Celtics. I uh, talked a little bit about Marcus Smart's bugaboo being Devin Booker. Um, I don't see that changing tonight. However, we do have another uh, interesting conundrum to throw into the mix. Okay. Um, Kelly Oubre is going to be coming off the bench tonight. Now, I'm not really on Ubre, and he's at a different position anyways, but my fear is, does this take away from Booker enough, or is that is it just way too early for that to even be a part of the thought process? I don't think it does. If anything, I think it may take a little bit away from T.J. Warren, but I don't okay. think that's going to be because, I mean, Booker is their, he's their number one guy, so it's rare that the number one guy takes a back seat, particularly when your number one guy is such a scorer. So that's the first thing. Uh, you, you mentioned he, him liking to play Boston. Let me just give you give the folks some numbers here. Um, November 8th, this year, 38 real, I thought real points. He put up 38 real points. December of 2017, he put up 38 real points. March of 2017, he put up 70 real points. Not fantasy points, actual buckets 70 and that was with Marcus Smart on the team and glued to his ass and he just lit him up and I mean if it's ever a guy that I want to play versus Boston it's him yep I can't disagree with anything that you just said there so um all right let's talk about Buddy Heald uh loves playing the Thunder he does he does. I mean, he, he man. I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of Booker and Heald. I mean, th- those those are my core. And, and if it's not Booker and Heald, it's Harden and Heald, or Harden and Booker. Those are my three guys that I'm not really swaying too much off of them. 
those are the guys that I like. Those are the guys in the spots that I want to play. And um, so all the things we talked about <clears throat> with De'Aaron Fox really apply to Buddy Hill. Um, and then if Bogdanovich misses, it's it's even more so. I mean, what what tends to happen with the Kings is it's either Bogdanovich or Heal that are going off. You don't have them both. I mean, they can both have good games, but they don't both hit like 50, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's the only concern there. And so if he sits, uh, if Bogdanovich sits, well, you know, he's not he's not in the way. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of what I'm looking. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, about a hundred and. Uh, news, Amon Shumpert, Bogdan Bogdanovich, and Marvin Bagley all listed as out for tonight. So there you go. Bam. Uh, breaking news on the podcast tonight. So that just, uh, that pretty much solidifies it. Buddy Heald is probably going to be close to core. Hey, he was for me from the morning, but so, uh, he might be a little chalkier now. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. Um, Doesn't scare me though. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, uh, all right. The last guy that I have to talk about at the position is Justin Holiday. Um, yep. You know, Chris Dunn has actually kind of opened up the floor a little bit for him. I really do like, I think he's underpriced, honestly, um, for the type of, uh, you know, minutes that he plays. Um, now, he only played 29 against Oklahoma City, but they got blown out in that game. So I'm not really worried about it. Uh, if, if I had to, like, he's 5,400. So, like, he's kind of my default, like, mid-range guy here in this, in this aspect. If I can't get up to Buddy, um, because of the rest of my lineup. Now, he's $1,000 cheaper than Buddy, but make no mistake about it. Buddy is the better play. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that Justin Holiday, because of the, you know, especially now with with Zach Levine out, but Chris Dunn is back, Bobby Fortis is back, uh, you got Lori Marketing back. Chris, Justin Holiday kind of becomes a forgotten man there, and he has quietly, maybe not an All Star type season, but he's probably maybe one two with De'Aaron Fox for most improved player. I would have to say, mm-hmm. um, and his price doesn't reflect it. And he's got the ability to go for forty, and uh, he's going to be unowned, unowned. Now I don't expect forty. That's more like a ceiling game, but thirty-five at fifty-four hundred on Fanduel, and yeah. he is where is he? He is. 5500 on DK. So DK actually has them priced up more. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm just I, – I love that mid-range um, price point of him on FanDuel tonight. Yeah, same here. So. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to the small forwards here. Talk about Kawhi Leonard because I'm not on him at all one bit. Well, I mean, so we've got Lowry out. We've got Ibaka out. Um, both confirmed for uh, for the Raptors, and so uh, he, I mean, you're going to have Van Vliet uh, starting there along with Greg Monroe. It's just there's a lot more shots, man. Those guys shoot. Those guys between Lowry and between Ibaka, they're a major part of the offense, and they're no longer there. And if you look at who's left. You've got Siakam, who is on my top core list of plays, which will cover neck and power forwards, um, who's not really a shooter. He's more of a play down low kind of guy. Um, and then you've got, uh, oh, I just got my congratulations email from in my seat to the live final. Thank you, sir. Um, from Fandle. Um, you've got Van Vliet, who's really more of a distributor. He's not really that much, that much of an offensive scorer. I mean, he can, but, uh, we've been, we've seen that when Lowry has been out with his back issues, Van Vliet's been racking up the assists. By the way, we should also mention Van Vliet in our point guards. Uh, we, we didn't, but he's definitely going to be part of the list. Um, oh yeah, he's part of the list. For sure. And then, and then you've got, um, you know, Danny Green, who's really more of a three and D guy. You've got 
uh, Greg Monroe was more of a down low guy. I mean, it just leaves a lot of necessity for Kawhi to, to, to turn it up on the offensive end. Um, he's going to be needed. Uh, it makes me like him. It makes me like, you know, cheaper plays like, uh, CJ Miles. They've got Norman Powell's coming back. Uh, he's not going to play a lot. It's his first game back. He's going to play. Uh, but nothing to, you know, in terms of actually rostering him. No, but it's going to have other opportunities for scores in the game. And Kawhi is their number one player. Um, that's what makes me like it. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, I agree with you. It's just, man, I'm looking at savings here. Um, yeah. As far as a roster type of build, and, and that's really the only reason why. I, I agree that he's a good play. Now, he's probably a DraftKings only play for me tonight because he's 200 less than uh, Kawhi Len- or sorry Kevin Durant, but um, he's still $300 more than Paul George. Right. You know, and that's, that's my whole thing is with these top guys, like the Durant Leonard, Paul George kind of tier. Um, I'm going probably with the one that's the cheapest and on FanDuel, that's kind of leading me to a lot of Durant and on DraftKings, that's leading me to a lot of Paul George, but that's so, all, I mean, listen, all upper echelons of uh, small forwards. Yeah. No no question. It doesn't mean that we're going to completely overlook Kawhi. Right. I, I mean, Kawhi's on my list. I don't want anybody to think I don't like him. He's just not finding his way into a lot of my builds currently. Yeah. That's why I want to point that out. And I get the savings. You know, he, he's, he's definitely priced as high as he's been uh, here lately. I get it. Um, and I might even like to play Paul George over Kawhi. I don't hate it. Um, I might even have a lot of builds where I have both Kawhi and Paul George. Yep. Uh, you know, so yeah, I think we're on the same page there. Although I think I might like Kawhi a little bit more. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Paul George. We kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, the three point shot is not a a strength of the Oklahoma city thunder. Obviously, uh, Russ can get hot from time to time. Terrence Ferguson can, meh, he'll, he can, he's either going to hit one or he's going to hit six. Um, Alex Abrinas is the same way. He's either going to hit zero or he's going to hit six. There's really no in between with those two guys. Um, Diallo is more of a slasher, so he's not really a three point shot. Um, Jeremy Grant's improved his three point shot this year, but he doesn't take a ton of them. It's Paul George, man. And like with the amount of threes that Buddy and Fox and Belitzi are going to take, he's going to have to shoot them. Um, and I, I just, I'm finding it very, and people are going to always call me Homer when I talk about Paul George, but whatever. Sure. This is the best I've seen Paul George play overall, all around, like offense and defense, the side of the ball. Um, yeah. Maybe yeah. ever, to be completely honest. Like, here's his three-point shot attempts. Um, the last three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games. Okay, going back to uh, the end of November. 8, 8, 13, 9, 6, 7, 6, 9, 10. Like, he's shooting the bejesus out of the ball from beyond the arc. And he's taking 18 to 27. Like, his low in shot attempts was in that Utah game where I think they just blew him out. And... Yeah, they just blew him out. He only took 10. Um, Still put up 49 points. But, like, he's going to give you 16 to 28 shots. Especially in this type of game. Yeah. Yeah. All day long. Yeah. So. um, All right. (laughs) Jonathan Isaac, because we're on the same page here. So, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm glad we are because I thought I was crazy. Um, So, first of all, Isaac. Well, that's still to be determined, so. No, there's there's nothing to be determined. You're fucking nuts. But um, <laughs> I, 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 but I was referring to this specific play. Um, so I think so. I, I've been playing Isaac a lot this year. Um, I like him actually a little bit more off the bench, but um, he is not a 35 points a game scorer. 
True he points, is, not fantasy points. True points. Is, right, actual points. He gets his rebounds. He gets his steals. He gets his blocked shots. Uh, he gets his assists. Um, he does all of the things that maybe aren't sexy per se, but they accumulate points. And those are the things that I'm looking at at Isaac that him doing a lot more of without Vucevic on the court. I think he benefits tremendously. Um, so I think that's where I'm going here. I think a lot of people are going to go run to Aaron Gordon, which I don't hate. Um, I don't love either. Um, for me, I'm going to pick, you know, Isaac, Augustine, maybe even Terrence Ross, those types of guys, uh, to pick up some of the offensive, uh, you know, gap that each of it's left. Yeah, I would, uh, kind of agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why I like him. He's cheap and he does it all. Um, it's not, it's not really hard to, to kind of figure out that I don't like guys that are scoring dependent unless they, you know, they, they're a main focal point of the offense. Unless they're um, Devin, unless they're Devin Booker. <laughs> yeah, but Devin Booker's even still going to give you, like, re- some rebounds and some assists. It might not be a lot, but, like, he's still going to be involved. Like, he's the main focal point of that offense, and that's, that's yep. one of the reasons why. Like, guys like Andrew Wiggins, like, who aren't even the, like, tonight Andrew Wiggins is going to be the third option. And yeah, it's quote unquote a good matchup, but he's going to be the third. It's a actually it's a neutral matchup for him. Um, he's going to be the third option on the offense, and he's scoring dependent. No thanks. Not even I don't not even at the price. Sure. Um, so that's why I think we're both kind of on Jonathan Isaac is because even though his shots falling, he's still going to play the minutes because he's active on the defensive end, and that's something that you know is is really kind of important to be able to stay on the court so yeah um all right each one more he's the last guy i want to talk about at this position and usually when one of these guys are out for uh the pelicans i run to deep to each one more because he's almost like the forgotten man yeah. um in fact you could probably add uh solomon hill who i don't like quite as much but uh also um darius miller darius miller as well uh you can add both of them into this mix but each one more is the main guy um, he's going to, his shot attempts are going to go up. His usage is going to go up and his mm-hmm. fantasy points per minute go up, mm-hmm. uh, with, you know, these two guys off the court. Um, yep. I was looking at it a little bit earlier and each one more, uh, his increase, he actually gets a 3.9% usage bump, um, and a 0.36 fantasy points per minute, uh, bump with holiday and, uh, uh, the, 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 the Miritich off the court. So I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I like it a lot too. I think, so I've got some with Darius Miller in there. Um, I think Darius Miller is a fantastic drop score candidate on Fandle. That's exactly what I'm using him for. Yeah. Yeah. I've, and I've I got s- him, him and going, house. Sorry. Him and house are my drop score candidates at the small forward position. See, I've got, uh, uh, I've got Darius Miller, OG, Justin Jackson, um, sure. and Gerald Green. So I guess House could be in that same that same mix. Yeah. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, okay, so each one more is forty six hundred dollars on um, DraftKings. Darius Miller is thirty six. So I still think he's in play with the amount of minutes he's going to get over there. Yeah. But just understand that you don't have the type of cushion that you do on Fandle. Right. So, all right, let's move on to power forwards here. Laurie Marketing, he's your top guy. Talk. Yeah, Marketing versus Brooklyn. Hollis Jefferson is questionable. Um, who's, who's you know, one of their better defenders, if not the only one that they have. Uh, without Zach Levine, I mean, he's, he's the... He, he becomes a de facto playmaker there. Obviously, you've got some other guys, but, um, you know, if you look at uh, Ice Cream Cone and um, Chris Dunn and Justin Holiday, uh, Wendell Carter Jr., I mean, really out of those guys, it's Holiday and Marketing that are, that are offensively focused. Um, so those are the two guys, and he's been priced up, but 
playing Brooklyn, who played on a back to back, who played last night in a barn burner of a game last night, coming off a high emotion versus the Lakers. Um, I mean, this is where I, this is exactly where I want to attack them. And I think the Bulls aren't good enough to blow them out. If this was a good team, I probably would stay away because Brooklyn's in a tough spot here. <clears throat> but the Bulls aren't good enough to blow this team out. So, you know, I think it's going to be a good match, match up here. And I, I want the strong pieces of the Bulls. And for me, it's Markinen and, and Wendell Carter. Yeah, I mean, I missed it the other night. I didn't think that, uh, you know, he was going to be able to, you know, really go off against the the Thunder. Um, Boy, did he. Whew. Yeah, he did. He, uh, I would have to, if you were to ask me if what we thought played out played out, I don't think it did. I would assume from the box score it didn't. But, because I missed the first part of that game, and he got hot, and there was just no stopping him. Um so I'll take my L there, but uh, I'm with you. He's outside of Anthony Davis. He's probably my top power forward of the night. Yeah, well, for sure. And you've got like a five thousand dollar price difference. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, what do you say? If he gets within twenty, we've got a good night. Yeah. So absolutely. All right, talk about Justin ja- or Jaron Jackson. So a lot of people are gonna be like, "What the hell are you talking about?" Right. I, I asked you. Even our lead NBA coach, Keith, asked me, what are you talking about? Right. Guys, that's exactly what you want in tournaments. You want a guy that can hit 47 points who everyone's like, where the hell did he come from? That's how you win tournaments. Jaron Jackson is going up against the Portland Trailblazers. The Portland Trailblazers are notorious for struggling, first of all, defensively, period, right? On top of that, opposing big men. Jackson is a really lengthy, long power forward. When Gasol is out, he plays the five. Like, I like think he... Go ahead, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, he's got elite blocks upside. He's got elite rebounding upside. He just needs to keep his hands to himself. There's two guys here in this position that need to keep their hands to themselves. No Um, kidding. But right now, I've got – the only thing I dislike about the Jaron Jackson play is you have Jamike Green back fully healthy. See, my whole thing is, is like, I agree with everything that you say, except Al Farouk Aminu is a great perimeter defender. Now, with that said – Jaron Jackson's not a perimeter power forward. He is no. not a traditional or not a tra- he is a traditional power forward. He is right. not a stretch four. So where I th- I think that I, I think that most of JJ's success is going to come when he's at the five against Nurkic, when he's um, you know bodying up Aminu. Uh, Normally, Aminu is a very, very, very good defender, like we've said, but this is not the type of matchup that's good for Aminu. You know, we've, we kind of point these out when to avoid and when to attack Aminu, and I can see what you're saying. My issue is is he going to be able to stay bodied with Nurkic because Nurkic is bigger than he is. So when he does move down to the five, when Gasol is out and they do play small ball and now they can put Jamichael green at the four is green, not the better play because of the price than Jaron Jackson. I just think that, Jamike doesn't have so so it depends on what site you're playing on. Uh FanDuel gives you three points for per per shot block. His upside is with his shot blocks. Okay. His his blocked shots. Um Jamike's upside is rebounds. Uh Jackson has the rebounds as well. So I just think the upside is 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 significantly higher and because of the price difference I think the ownership will be a little bit higher on Jamaica as well. 
Um, and I, I want, like, I, I'm still waiting to see, you know, what happens here with Conley. I know Conley said he's probable. There are some other question marks behind Memphis, but if everything plays out the way that it is at the moment, it's purely an ownership blocks upside type of matchup type of environment for me in Jackson. I think it's sneaky. Um, hmm. I think if you're pulling a uh, main slate type of build with only hammer guys, I think he's extremely sneaky. Um, and I like it. I don't know how much of it I'm going to have, but I can see the value behind what it's going to be. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, the other guy that needs to keep his hands to himself is Wendell Carter Jr. Um, talked about it a little bit last night. He's going against a, uh, you know, a, a Brooklyn team coming off the back end of a back-to-back. He plays the five. He's listed as a power forward and a center. I, I mean, there's not a lot of things to not like here, except for the fact that, you know, Bobby Portis can easily steal more minutes from him just because of the fact that he cannot stay out of foul trouble. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, if the guy stays out of foul trouble, he's on the court, he produces. If he doesn't, he doesn't. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, nothing monumental there. Um, all right, let's talk about Pascal Siakam uh, real quick, and then we'll move on to centers. Yeah, so Siakam for me is is one of my other core uh, power forward plays. Um, no Ibaka, right? No Lowry, like we talked about. No, you know, some of these big name plays here. So uh, for Toronto and. We've seen with Kawhi out, Siakam loses flip in mind. Well, now you've got Ibaka, his front court mate. So uh, I, I think Ibaka goes nuts here versus the Pacers. Or excuse me, Siakam. I was about to say, um, I don't think Ibaka's going to go nuts because he's not playing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, he's he's right now my highest known power forward uh, outside of Laurie Marketing. So. Um, there's some, uh, there's some sneaky plays at this position that we'll go over. And I, I know you've got notes today. Lucy's got an article out already. I'll have notes a little bit later on. So, um, we'll talk about those. Uh, let's talk about the centers here real quick. Um, we've talked about this situation five or six times, both of these situations. Uh, we're going to touch on them real quick here. Uh, Mo Bamba and Greg Monroe. Let's talk about Mo Bamba first. Uh, Vordy got word that he's likely to receive his first start of the season, uh, first start of his career. Uh, Mo Bamba is, I, I, I watched him at Texas. Um, he's a physical dominant presence. And then you get him going up against, uh, against the likes of, uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, um, maybe some Jakob Pertle. I don't see how these guys are going to really slow him down. Um, all the rebounds for uh, Mr. Bamba. Yeah, I mean, guys, just play Bamba. <laughs> I mean, you've got some, you know, studs here at the center position, but you've got a guy in Bamba at, on Fanduel who's 3900 bucks, who's going to play the Spurs. He's going to be at home. Like you said, his first NBA career start – I mean, he's a rookie, so it's his first start um, with Vucevic out with a huge gap to be filled. The guy puts up numbers with 20 minutes. Imagine what he's going to do with 30-plus. And so you look at it. So let's just take the top-priced guy at this spot, okay, Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid has 65-point upside, right? We've seen it. But even at 40, where what you're hoping to get from Bamba, the difference in price, what is it, three times? It doesn't it doesn't make sense? So you're in a situation now where you can get a five, six, seven k range value wise center at under four k. You do that. You do it. You don't think about it. You do it because he does also have some pretty serious blocks upside. 
he has some really serious three-point range that he can do. And we know he's going to gobble up a ton of rebounds because Gordon doesn't like to do that very much. He's more, he's too pretty for that. So I, I don't, I don't see how Bamba isn't the top choice. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he's going to play more minutes than Greg Monroe. He's cheaper than Greg Monroe. Uh, I think on DK you can actually make a case for playing both of them in the same lineup. Oh yeah. Uh, if you want to, I don't think you have to. Uh, Bamba is. The core. I mean, we've talked about it time and time again. When we get a cheap center that's going to get a start and get all the minutes and a good matchup, we just kind of lock and load. And uh, right now he's finding himself into a lot of my lineups. So um, my other guy that I really love tonight, and it sucks because he was my top guy before the Vooch news came out, is Carl Anthony Towns. And... I like to attack Andre Drummond with guys that are athletic around yeah. <laughs> are athletic around the basket and yeah. can pull um, their man out from the rim. Sure. I I just I love it. I, I love Carl Anthony Towns. He was my one of my top plays the other night, and I'm all over it again tonight. I mean, just sucks I, that <laughs> just sucks because you have to change your whole build in order to fit him in to lineups because right now the chalk is paying down for bomb at center. Oh yeah, no, it totally is. Um, and, and, and you bring up the point that I wanted to bring up as well, which is, you know, when you know 60% of the field is going to Mo Bamba at center, uh, you want to give yourself a chance if he blows, if he if he sucks, right? If, I mean, he's not going to put up five. I, I don't see any out barring injury or like significant foul trouble. I don't see it happening. But that's what you want. You want you want to be put in a situation where if it doesn't work out, you can crush. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's you know what I'm looking at here. Yeah, I just like it because not only that, but I'm also getting off the che- uh, the uh, chalky roster construction. So, you know, if I'm paying sure. up at, you know, the center position, then I'm getting a completely different player pool than those that are paying down. And that means that more of my lineup is going to be lower owned. And in tournaments, that's kind of what I want. Right. So right. I'm with you there. Um. All right, I kind of talked a little bit about Andre Drummond. I'm not on him because of the fact that, like I said, I think Cat's going to pull him away from the basket a little bit more than normal. Um, This isn't the type of matchup I like to play my Andre Drummond in. Yeah. But you kind of like him, and kind of explain to us why. Uh, Drummond? Yes, Drummond. Well, so, first of all, I almost... Excuse me. I almost always like... um, to play centers versus Cat. I mean, Cat's just not a defender. Um, I think this is the kind of game where Drummond might get, you know, 25 rebounds, frankly. Um, we're seeing the Pistons now basically letting Blake Griffin run the point guard. Um, primary playmaker, ball handler, he even brings the ball off the court. It's not even Reggie Jackson anymore. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, that means he's out on the perimeter a lot more. I mean, he still drives to the basket a lot, but not like he used to, right? Um, he's, he's, a, he's got a three point shot. He's a lot more perimeter oriented, Blake Griffin is, than he's been his entire career this year. And that leaves a lot for Drummond. Uh, Drummond is 9,500 on Fandle. Uh, for you guys that are playing DK or Fantasy Draft or whatever else. I'm almost going to pencil in a double double, so you're going to get those points as well. Um, he's 91 on DK, and he's even cheaper on DraftKings. So, uh, and he gets you off of. I like the Bamba play, but he puts you in a position to where if Bamba only puts up like 20, Drummond can legit put up 55 <coughs> here versus Cat. Um, and by the way, Cat can do the same. <laughs> right? These are two centers that I like to play a lot, and they're two centers that I like to play against a ton. 
both of them. So I can see merit to playing either one of these guys or even both of them on DraftKings if you want to put one in the utility spot. Yep. I would uh I would agree with everything except for I, I just I'll pay the extra four hundred and go get Carl Anthony Towns tonight. I'm I'm fine with it. I'm totally so, both of those guys for me are pretty much even kill. Okay. Uh we don't have to agree all the time. So last guy that uh you wanted to talk about was Rudy yes. Gobert. Uh I love it. Yes. I just he he's gonna be forgotten. Um So here's the thing about Gobert. You are going to see, I'm willing to bet, the Jazz are going to start Jay Crowder over Derek Favors. Why? Because that's what they do against fast-paced teams. The Warriors don't really have a true center. They will. They did. And they will. Uh, they did with Damian Jones, and they will with Boogie. But today, they don't. Um, they've got Looney, who's really a power forward, who plays the center. They've got some Jordan Bell. They bring in Yarepko, who's a small forward, right? They're just a small team. So I, 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 I see them starting Rubio, Mitchell, Ingles, Crowder, and Gobert. Now, that basically leaves the entire paint to Gobert. That's where I want Gobert. I want him owning the paint. Yeah, he'll have a little bit of Draymond in his face. But Gobert likes that. It works for him. I'm not worried about Gobert backing down Draymond Green. He won't. So, like you said, he's going to be forgotten. He's about a thousand bucks cheaper than, or 1300 bucks cheaper than Cat and Drummond. So, a lot of advantages there. Gobert's playing at home. I've got a few builds where I'm pairing either Rubio and Gobert or Mitchell and Gobert. Because I really like this game. It's going to go underlooked. I believe, given some of the other chalky games, don't close your eyes to that game. Yeah, being in Utah is not going to be, uh, um, you know, a, a, a sexy place to play, guys. Um, he's had success against the Warriors, guys. Uh, he has had success. He's never broke 50, but uh, he's usually right around that 38 to 44 mark. Um and at his price tag right now, I, I could definitely see it because you do still have the potential to get up to that 45 to 50 mark, um, 50 ish mark. Right. Um, you know, and if this game stays close late, then you know what? He could push that. Um, the, uh, the jazz got to get going here and they, they kind of know it. They know it. They, they, definitely, uh, they definitely know it for a team that was a NBA, uh, darling. They are now 14, the 14th seed in the Western Conference. Yeah. And this was a team that was, they were the three seed last year. This was a team that I expected to go to the Western Conference Finals last year. That's how good they were playing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, they sure. were, uh, they were, they were playing really well. And I don't know what it is. Um, a lot of it could have probably had to do with the, the brutal road schedule they had to start out the season, but. It's, uh, they got to get going and they know it. They definitely do know it. So, uh, all right. Anything else you want to touch on before we get out? No, sir. All righty. Congrats again, my friend. Thank we you. will, uh, now we got to get the rest of us going out there. Um, for myself, for me, for the DFS Army, we go. Peace out. Have a good day.